Welcome to Beth Takun and our ongoing study of the Torah in the light of the spiritual seasons of the year. This week, we are in portion Mishpatim, Exodus 21 to 24. As a reminder, there's a link to an outline below the video. This one might be a good one to go through with the outline. Just suggest that. Before we get to the portion, let's do a little review, as I like to do, and open up an idea I've been alluding to but haven't dug into much yet. And that's going to be the idea of the ancient Jewish wedding. In our exploration through the calendar and the Torah portion so far, we started out by connecting the fall feasts, including Sukkot, to the finalization of a wedding, a wedding to God. At Sukkot and throughout the winter, the bride is stepping up to be the mature bride, right? We've said that many times, the bride stepping up. And so we have been focusing our studies of the Torah portions on how it is that the bride puts away her old life, finds her new identity within the marriage, and steps up to express herself within that marriage from a heart of love for her groom. The bride comes to a place of producing fruit from the seed the groom has placed within her. These are stages of maturity, and so as we are drawing nearer to the end of the calendar and the end of the yearly cycle, we've been focusing on what it means to be mature. Last week, our topics included how we go deep in Torah study and some characteristics of being masters of time, which are two elements of being mature. Not that any of us are mature, right? We're all still on a path, but um, we know a little bit of the difference between being an adult and being a child, right? We've gone through that. As we have been exploring together, one question that might come up is why we are now talking about a wedding to God at Mount Sinai, which happens in the late spring at Shavuot, if the marriage doesn't happen until Sukkot in the late fall. So are there two marriages? Is there a marriage at Shavuot and a marriage at Sukkot? Did we maybe get divorced and then remarried in the fall? What's going on? So is the marriage in the spring or the fall? And um, as with so many questions like this, the answer is yes, it's both. So let me explain how it can be both. Shavuot is the second stage of marriage and Sukkot is the third. In order to understand how marriage to God is being pictured in the calendar, we need to understand a bit about the ancient Jewish wedding. In short, the anxious, ancient wedding has three stages, and with each of the three pilgrimage festivals, we experience another stage of the wedding. So maybe you're seeing a connection already to Mishpatim, the three pilgrimage festivals. And um, we repeat this every year. We repeat this three-stage marriage every year as a newly reborn person, reborn to a higher level at Nisan. One important way we approach Passover, Shavuot, and Sukkot is through the lens of this ancient three-part marriage ceremony. So let's briefly talk about these three phases of the ancient Jewish wedding it's a bit different now, by the way, um, because today they do the second and the Jewish people traditionally do the second and the third part of the ceremony together at the same time with one wedding ceremony. Um, you may have heard the Jewish wedding described before, but you probably haven't heard it connected to the calendar in the way that we're going to connect it today. The three stages of weddings in times past are called Shidukin, Eruzin, and Nisuin. These are not difficult to understand. Very briefly, the first stage, Shidukin, happens when two children are very young, when the groom's parents, actually the father usually, but I'm sure they both talked about it, when they select a bride for their son when he's still a boy. In the calendar, this is happening at Passover in unleavened bread. Unleavened bread is a time when Israel is just an infant, a child, just learning to walk as the counting of the Omer begins. 
because God is so powerful here in the Passover story, Israel has little free will. At Passover, it's God the Father and Israel the child. At this first pilgrimage festival, God the Father sets aside Israel as a future bride for his son, Yeshua. And so we come to step two. When the two come of age, they will be given a choice as to whether or not they want to go through with the marriage, right? They're not just going to push this marriage on the, the two young people. They, they get to say whether or not they want to go through. And if both of them agree, then they will proceed with the second phase of the marriage process called eruzin, which is also called kiddushin, right? Setting apart, making holy, you know, uh, or at least a separation. So eruzin involves a hupa and the presentation and acceptance of the marriage contract. And this is what we are seeing at Mount Sinai, right? In the spring, late spring. The cloud on the mountain is the hupa. And the Ten Commandments are the summary of the marriage contract. We will also see a celebratory meal here connected to Eruzin in the Torah portion. At this point, the two are engaged but do not yet live together or even consummate the marriage. Instead, the groom goes to prepare a house for the bride alongside his parents' home while the bride focuses on personal preparations. The third stage, Nisuin, happens when the groom shows up to retrieve his bride with much fanfare and even romance. The two again enter the hupa to finalize their vows before the groom whisks the bride away to her new home. So maybe in that second, second hupa experience you're hearing the sukkah, right? You're hearing about the sukkah there. This is when the marriage reaches a new level of intimacy as the marriage is finally consummated. All of this is being pictured in many ways during the fall Moedim, the fall, right, in the seventh month. Sukkot is connected to the incarnation of Yeshua, Yeshua who tabernacled among us, he tented among us. The incarnation is the arrival of the groom to take his bride. Those who have done Sukkot recognize that it is a time of special intimacy in the Sukkah. We could even call it a romantic time. So once the wedding is finalized, the bride sets about learning how to be the bride. And that has been our main topic since we began this study back in the eighth month is when we started with Parsha Noach. How it is that the bride steps up in increasing independence and maturity to be the bride. Well, with that introduction, let's turn now to portion Mishpatim. If your Bible has headings, you'll probably see headings in this portion like sundry laws, right? Um, I, I think mine has that twice in this uh, Torah portion. Mishpatim means judgments or ordinances. This portion is second only to Kitete in number of commandments, having 53 mitzvot, or is that um, a, a different Kitisa? Uh, one or the other. <laughs> And so um, it has 53 uh, mitzvot in this Torah portion. A big portion of the oral Torah is devoted to working out how to practically do these 53 commandments. Subjects here include the treatment of indentured servants, laws about justly handling physical harm and property destruction, laws about how different classes of people should treat each other and relate to each other, and laws about the Moedim, the uh, appointed times in the calendar. These are laws that bring people into unity in a community. After enumerating many commandments, God then promises to make the way open for conquering the land. Moses communicates with God um, what God has said to the people. And they answer with one voice, all the words that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Moses writes everything down that he has received so far. And this is important because included in what he would have written at this point would be the commandment to not make idols, right? And we're going to see that that is especially broken soon. So after writing, Moses has an unusual 12-part altar built 
at the base of the mountain, and he has young men from the nation bring burnt offerings and peace offerings of oxen. Remember, the Levites have not yet been designated as the priestly tribe. So it would seem that Moses saw fit to have young men from all 12 tribes bring these first national offerings to the Lord, the offerings from which they get the blood of the covenant. That blood is, is um, taken by the hands of all 12 tribes. Uh, the blood from these sacrifices is then divided in half, half being splashed against the altar and half set aside to sprinkle on the people. In other words, half to the Lord and half to the people. Before they are sprinkled, however, Moses reads out what he has written, the book of the covenant. And the people again say, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And they add the second time, and we will be obedient. Moses then sprinkles the blood on the people. It says he threw the blood at them, <laughs> sprinkling them, um, saying, behold, the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. Finally, Moses, Aaron, Nadav, and Avihu, along with 70 elders of Israel, so 74 altogether, go up the mountain and have a celebration meal with God, and they see him. At the end of the portion, Moses leaves Aaron and her in charge and goes up the mountain, taking Joshua with him. I'm not sure how far Joshua went up with him, but Joshua goes with him and he stays for 40 days to receive the first set of tablets and to continue receiving the Torah from God. So a couple of points stick out right away here. First of all, it is being made very clear to everyone that not only is Israel entering into an agreement with God as a nation, but also that each tribe and each person is personally entering into that agreement. The 12 tribes bring the sacrifices of the covenant, and the blood of the covenant literally touches every person in the nation. When they answer Moses, it is all of the people answering, right? All of them speaking together as one voice, right? It's not just some representative answering for the people. Again, it's another extraordinary scene recorded here, unlike anything that has happened before or since. It's, it is solemn and dramatic, and as we read it, we can't help but think ahead a bit to how quickly they will violate the covenant with the incident of the golden calf. But for the people in that moment, they must have had such a mixture of emotions, mostly wonder and I think joy and excitement, but also some apprehension, right? What are we getting ourselves into? But isn't that exactly what is going through the mind of every bride and groom on their wedding day, right? We're excited, and what are we getting ourselves into here? All right, so I want to spend much of our time today on the verses in this portion that directly address the Moedim and the calendar, the pilgrimage festivals. But before we get to that, let me say a few words about commandments in general, since this is a great compilation of commandments <clears throat> and that's what defines this portion, Mishpatim, is named for these commandments. Much of humanity's legal and social law comes from this little Torah portion. These few words written in a certain book made from certain hides 3,300 years ago. It has seeped into all cultures' um, law. Remember that as we read these early stages of Israel's salvation from the slavery of Egypt, we are reading on multiple levels because we are in the final stages of the yearly salvation cycle. So we, we need to read early for Israel, late for us in the calendar. So we're reading on multiple levels. What I'd like to do now is look at several levels of approaching God's commandments, how we look at and relate to God's commandments, since this Torah portion has so many mitzvot or mishpatim in it. We should always be growing in how we approach God's commandments. The reality is, however, that as we go about our day and week and year, we can approach the mitzvot in a variety of ways. It's not like we have a smooth transition from one way of seeing the commandments in relating to the commandments to the next. Our attitude 
toward doing God's commandments can depend on our mood in a given moment, our focus, how busy we are, our health, whatever else is happening in life. But in general, as we mature, we want to spend more and more time relating to the commandments in mature ways. So as we begin, let me point out that one of the most common words we use for God's commandments is mitzvah. We say there are 613 mitzvot, right? The plural of mitzvah. This Hebrew word is used about 300 times in various forms in the Torah. The root of mitzvah is often given as a root that means to attach or to join, savta. A mitzvah, a commandment, joins us to God. That's a foundational understanding for approaching God's commandments. And I think it's something we need to remind ourselves now and then, because we drift, like I said, into this attitude and that attitude. When we are young, however, we don't look at commandments as opportunities to be joined to the lawgiver, right? Did you ever think that when you were in school and the teacher was laying down the law? Oh, that's an opportunity to be joined to the teacher. No, we don't think that way. How do we see rules and commands when we are young? The sages liken the taking on of the Torah to a bar or bat mitzvah. At 12 or 13, a girl or boy becomes an adult and takes personal responsibility for his or her walk with the Lord according to his commandments. How does a 12-year-old look at rules, right? We're, we're, in a way, in one way, we're seeing Israel at the foot of Mount Sinai as a teenager. How do they look at rules? Mostly they see them as fences that hem them in, often unnecessarily. A 12-year-old's brain has much more development to go through. Praise the Lord, right? We don't want to be stuck in that place. And they have little life experience. It's often hard for teens to grasp the wisdom of rules. I would say teens mostly do follow the rules. And I, when I was a teacher of, of teenagers in high school, I was impressed by them. I thought, you know what? Mostly they're trying to do what we're asking them to do, even if they don't understand. But they do so, they, they obey the rules more from duty than from understanding that following the rules is how we live the fullness of life intended for us. They just don't have enough life experience yet. They don't have enough maturity yet to understand the benefits of all those rules. So at a higher level, we begin to understand that the commandments are more than just rules. They are snippets of God's mind and will. The Tanya says that when a person knows and grasps in his mind a Torah commandment, he therefore grasps and holds and encompasses with his mind, the divine wisdom and will. It's like our mind is surrounding God's mind and will, is what the Tanya is saying, when we grasp that mind and will through the commandments. The commandments are a means of understanding God's mind and aligning ourselves with God's will. Higher still, as we mature, we begin to realize that God's commandments are about love, and they are reflections of mankind's inner nature. They aren't just rules and they aren't just snippets of God's mind. They aren't boundaries imposed on us that we struggle to do only by fighting against our nature to bend our will to match God's will. On the contrary, the commandments are an expression of our true nature. They are a mirror to us. Our deep nature is love. We are made in God's image, and God is love. And these commandments are how we express love. God's law is not imposing a structure on us from the outside that makes us chop off half of who we are to fit into that box. The Torah is giving us the key for crafting the outside that matches our inside. Anything we have to chop off to conform to the commandments is not really a part of who we are. And this is a very different way of relating to the commandments than the first way of immaturity, though that first way is a necessary stepping stone. Well, let's keep going even a bit deeper with our perspective on the Torah. It's more than a set of rules imposed on us from the outside, more than snippets of God's mind, and more than a mirror of our true nature, which is love. The commandments are the means by which we become 
co-creators with God and are united to him. So how is this so? The following idea grows out of a teaching that Grant has shared with Beth Takun, and it's a bit deep, and I can't remember how much I have added to it in my own mind, but let's just say that if you disagree with any part of what I'm about to say, we'll just chalk that up to me not being able to restate it properly, right? It's no reflection of Grant, <laughs> okay? As we have been saying, the commandments are an integral part of being married to God. When men put on tefillin, we repeat the following verses from Hosea 2, and I will betroth you to me forever, right? I will marry you forever. I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice, in steadfast love and in mercy. <clears throat> I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. So notice that the first cords that bind us to God in marriage, in betrothal, are righteousness and justice. And the word translated justice here is mishpat, the name of our Torah portion. Somehow these mishpatim are joining us to God in marriage. So through the commandments, we live out, we live out our marriage to God, and part of marriage is fertility. So in a way, we bear his children in the world. I know that I just said something kind of big. In a way, we bear his children in the world. And that which we bear in the world can be described as the living word, like God's own son is described. What we bear in our marriage with God is the living word. We are all being given the chance to bear the living word like the human mother Mary did. Now, don't read more into that than I'm saying. There's only one Son of God, Yeshua. But if we are married to God, then we must also bear the living word somehow as Mary did. And how do we do that? He gives us the light of truth embedded in the seed of the Torah commandments. The seed is alive on the inside with truth, what we call the spirit of the law, spirit, life, right? It's the inside of the law is alive. But that seed needs a dark place in which it can take root and form into its final intended form. The seed is a tiny spiritual thing that basically lacks a physical expression in the world. So that's where we come in. We are the soil that receives the seed. We take those seed commandments, internalize them, and make a way for them to come into the physical realm through our acting out of those commandments. When we do that, what we've done is we have taken the word from God that lacked a body, we've incubated it, and we've figured out how to put a body on it. And we've, you know, we figured out how to act it out in the lowest realm. This is what the bride does. And without us doing what the bride does, the word that started as a seed cannot be fully birthed into this lowest realm, the realm of action. God needs us to receive the seed of the word and craft a body for it. In that way, we become co-creators with him. Together we give birth to the living word. So I know that's rather deep and it, and it went by a little quickly, but I think it's a profound way of seeing the commandments. They aren't just rules. They aren't just reflections of God's mind or our inner being. They are seeds that he implants in us so that we can bring them into being in his creation. And when we are doing this, we are drawn to him and he to us. We are producing together as husband and wife. So the last point I'll tack on here is that when we are seeing the mitzvot in more mature ways, we want to make our observance beautiful. We want the details of the performing of the mitzvot to be not only right, but personalized and as perfect as we can make it without losing the life of it, of course. In Yeshua, and with Yeshua's example, we are kept from tipping into imbalance in this area so that our beautification of the mitzvot 
will be life-giving rather than life-consuming, right? We don't want the tradition that beautifies to just sap all of our life and all of our time, right? So Yeshua brings balance there. Well, let's move now to the main topic for today for Parsha Mishpatim. I want to look at a fundamental and very important three-step progression we can see in the verses that address the Moedim in this portion. In chapter 23, this is Exodus 23, we are given three annual Moedim that are made distinct by the commandment to come to Jerusalem for each of them. They come to be known as the three pilgrimage festivals. The passage begins with, Three times in the year you shall keep a feast to me. And it ends, the passage ends with, Three times in the year shall all your males appear before the Lord God. So the three pilgrimage festivals are listed under slightly different names, but this is what they are. They are unleavened bread, Shavuot, and Sukkot. So part of my reason for digging into this pattern of one, two, three here is not just to help us understand the Moedim and the calendar, but to help us understand a pattern that runs much deeper than the calendar. As we unravel the mysteries of the seasons, we're learning about a great many elements of the Word and the world. We are learning how to read the Word better because we are seeing the underlying structure of it. And it's the same with the world, the underlying structure of the world. The underlying structure of the Word is Yeshua, salvation. And the underlying structure of the world is also Yeshua. All of it was made through Him, who is the Word. And all of it is telling the story of salvation. And that story, that story of salvation can be told on a very basic level as three steps. So we're going to learn, we're, you know, what we're doing is we're doing more than just exploring three steps in the calendar. We're exploring three steps in all of reality. And when you become deeply sensitive to it, you will begin to see these three steps everywhere you look, particularly in the Bible. This is a very powerful tool, actually. It's a very powerful lens. It's a Jewish lens for seeing the word, it's, and it's an extremely important one. So let's walk through the progression of one, two, three in Jewish thought. Hannah Weisberg has a succinct description of this three-part progression. And we're going to look at many examples, but let's just listen to her quick explanation. She says this, One implies that there exists only a single reality and suggests absolute conformity. Everything has to conform to that one reality. Two indicates divisiveness and disparity right, as two opposing rival approaches. Three finds an underlying unity, right, a unity between disparate entities, between different entities. So I like to summarize what Hannah Weisberg is saying here as one is oneness, two is separation, three is reunification, reunification. Once again, one means Either you only have one thing, or you have one thing that is so powerful that everything else is simply forced to live in that thing's reality. There's no free will with the number one. Two is a point of separation, but it doesn't just make two. It makes two opposites that may seem like they can't really exist together. Three brings the split of two back together, but in a way that makes peace between the two. Three is not like returning to the initial oneness. It's finding, it's a finding of how the two that separated from each other actually are meant to fit together as complements to halves. Grant has actually gone over this idea of one, two, three many times with us in the past. And one of the examples he gives is the story of Adam being split into two and then coming back together with Eve, um, you know, so one atom is split into two and then comes back together in a different way, right? In a different way. 
So here's another example from Jewish history. Rabbi Eliezer, Eliezer said the, the world was created in Tishrei, the seventh month. Rabbi Yahashua said that it was created in Nisan, the first month. After a lengthy debate involving many rabbis, no firm resolution was reached. It would seem that they can't both be true, so which is it? Eventually, along comes Rabbeinu Tom, who says, right, this is the, it's both, right? This is the, it's both thing that the Jewish people love to do. So Rabbeinu Tom comes along and he says that in Tishrei, it came into God's mind to create the world. And in Nisan, he actually does it. I think the Jewish teachers love this kind of reconciliation more than any other kind of Torah debate. So we, we have actually looked at one example of this pattern already today in the three steps of the ancient Jewish marriage. So let's go over that again through this lens of this three-step pattern. Step one, Shidukin, happens when the boy and the girl are young and the groom's parents pick a future wife for him. It's a decision that is made for the children when they have no choice because they are too young. They are simply living in their parents' world, right? This is one reality. Um, this is a kind of oneness because one side is so powerful that the other side lacks a real choice. Step two brings in the idea of choice and separation. In the second step of marriage, the two are old enough to make their own decisions, to sign off on the deal or not. The parents have to give them the freedom to make that choice. They have to release them to their choice. There's a kind of separation they have to do. All right, you're old enough, I guess. You can make this decision. Uh, this, this stage of marriage, kind of paradoxically, also involves the separation of the two young people as they go separate ways to prepare to be married. So we see separation on multiple levels with step two. Step three, Nisuin, is the coming back together of that which was separated. In the third step of marriage, not only do the couple come together finally, but they also return to the groom's home to live alongside the parents. And when they return, they are adults instead of children. And they're not simply living in their parents' reality anymore. They have more choice now, and they are choosing to support the family and the parents as they get old, as they get older. So this pattern is actually set right at the beginning of creation. Usually, if you can find something in the first chapter of Genesis, you want to do that because that's where the pattern is being set for everything. So let's take days one, two, and three from Genesis as another example. We should expect to see some kind of reflection, as I said, of the pattern right here at the beginning of the Torah. Days one, two, and three are days for setting the stage for the higher forms of life and for man in particular, right? Three days of setting the stage. The way I want to look at these days is to gauge each day's potential in relation to mankind and free will for mankind, etc. even though mankind has not been created yet. So that's going to make more sense as we go through each of the days. On day one, light is created and separated from the darkness, or light is formed and separated from the darkness. The light is pronounced good. Day one is the foundation for the creation of a realm of light and a realm of darkness. But we're not there yet. This is just naked light and naked darkness. When light and dark are obviously what they are, when they don't yet have any covering, there is no real choice. The choice is too obvious, too transparent. Grant has often said that an obvious Satan worshiper is not much of a danger to most people. It's the wolves in sheep's clothing that are the real danger, right? The darkness puts on a covering. That's the real danger. At this point, if mankind is shown light and darkness, he will choose the light, which is called good. There's, there's still a clarity here that removes choice, so truth dominates. On day two, the waters above are divided from the waters below. It is the day of creation most focused on separation, right? Oneness, separation, reunification. 
it is understood that on day two, the spiritual and physical realms are created. The spiritual realm, the physical realm. And now we have the potential for man to really have the choice to go a separate way. The physical realm is called the realm of separation. It is a place where the darkness masks God in such a way that it looks like it functions on its own without God. So this is a critical point when the creation is capable of giving man a real choice to separate from God. Day three sends a wonderful message. I really like this message in day three of creation. It's a day that teaches about the process of reunification. Our pattern, again, is oneness, separation, and reunification. On day three, the seas are given boundaries, allowing for dry land to appear, and the plants are created on that land. The message of day three is this. Even though you're going to turn headlong into physicality and darkness, and separate from me, when you call out to me from that darkness, I will put boundaries on those physical waters below that are drowning you, and I will bring order to that chaos. And once I have brought order, I will teach you how to really live, how to have life. And that life is like the plants. The plants are always oriented upward to the light. They are always receiving from the spiritual realm, the realm of light, yet they remain anchored in the darkness below. In this way, they are able to transcend and rise above the lower realm, even as they stay rooted in it. And that's what we are to do. It's quite a picture. Again, it's God's poetry and it's marvelous. And through God's process of bringing order and teaching us life, we are reunited with him. We are reunited with him. So let's take our last example of this fundamental pattern of oneness, separation, and reunification from Parsha Mishpatim, where we read about the three pilgrimage festivals. How does Passover show us a kind of lopsided unity, a unity where one side simply dominates everything else and there isn't a lot of choice? What we're interested in in this story is <clears throat> God's relationship with Israel. So that's what we're tracking. How is God relating to Israel? In the Passover story, <clears throat> there's a great deal of unity between God and the people. But it's not so much a unity based on choice. It's a unity based on God being hugely powerful and the people being especially weak. God is the rescuer. The people are basically pulled out of Egypt by God's powerful arm. They are newborn babes. The people don't have a huge amount of choice at this point. They simply conform to God's will. Well, how does Shavuot show a separation opposing sides? Taking on the Torah rather quickly results in separation when the people stumble and break the covenant with the golden calf, right? So we're tracking God's relationship with Israel here. Once you agree to the covenant, you know, initially that's a bond, but you need to keep your end of the deal or else you suffer the curses of the Torah and the breaking of the relationship with God. And we see that it is not long before Israel breaks the covenant. This falling after taking on the covenant is what Paul calls the Torah's ministry of death. And it is meant to lead eventually to a better view of ourselves and repentance, a clearer view of, of what we've got going on inside that's not so great. And it, that leads us to repentance. So there's a purpose for the Torah's ministry of death. It is part of God's plan because what he is really after is the rejoining, the rejoining that follows. The imagery of separation is very strong here at Shavuot. There are right and left tablets. There are two loaves of bread that are offered at Shavuot. Even the tongues of fire, right? These tongues of fire that um, we see settle on the disciples' head in Acts 2 at Shavuot are described as cloven, right? Cloven flames, separated, divided in some way. Shavuot also occurs near the end of spring, the beginning of the dry season in Israel. The summer in Israel is described as the separation of heaven and earth because there's so little rain during that season and rain comes from above, the, you know, the realm above. The fields and wilderness areas turn yellow and shrivel up 
this is a reflection of the separation we experience connected to receiving the Torah at Shavuot and then stumbling with it. Lastly, let's turn to Sukkot and reunification. After the separation of the summer, we go through an intense 10-day period of repentance. In fact, we go through a whole month of repent repentance with the sixth month of Elul. But then we have a very intense 10 days at the beginning of Tishrei, Tishrei culminating in Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur shows us the basis by which we are reunified with God. It is by the blood that is brought into the Holy of Holies <clears throat> on that day. We are told in Hebrews that the true substance of this blood, right, that, that the physical blood we see is a shadow of, is that of Yeshua's blood. That's the true substance. And it is Yeshua himself who brings that blood into the heavenly holy of holies as our heavenly high priest. Yom Kippur is followed five days later by Sukkot, which is the beginning of bringing that reunification down into the physical realm. Truly, Sukkot is a time of intimacy with both God and our communities. One of the main elements of Sukkot is the four species that are brought together and waved you know, before the Lord. Tradition equates these four to four kinds of people in the community who, at this time, are all recognized as necessary parts of the community. At the temple, 70 bulls are sacrificed over the course of Sukkot, one for each of the nations of the world, right? Bringing together all these nations and Israel. Sukkot is a joyous time of getting together in the sukkah. Everything about it fits the third stage of reunification. I think that's why we like it so much. And then, of course, there's the food, right? <laughs> so we, all, we like anything with food. This three-step progression is the root pattern of the entire salvation pattern, right? Three steps, it's a root pattern of the entire salvation pattern. So let me repeat that. If it is the root pattern of the salvation pattern, then it is the root pattern of all of creation. There, you just understood the root pattern of everything you can see and read in the Word. So to close this section, I'd like to share some thoughts from the Lubavitcher Rebbe that apply the three-step pattern to marriage. He says that there are three types of marriages, the singular marriage, the Tusa marriage, and the three-dimensional marriage. In the first, one of the pair simply dominates the other. In the second, they both preserve their distinctions as individuals. And actually, they cling to those individual distinctions probably a bit more than they should. They share everything, and they deeply affect each other, but they do so on their own terms. This is not so much a union as it is a relationship between individuals. And the third type, the two collaborate to create a third reality which encompasses and suffuses them both while still preserving their differences. The marriage itself becomes a third element in this type of marriage. There are two individuals who are working together to craft a marriage life together. Well, let's turn our thoughts now to Yeshua. How does Yeshua show us the three-step pattern we've been talking about? Regarding oneness, we are told that Yeshua had a kind of oneness with God before he came to this world. John 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Being in the presence of God, being one with God, is a place of supernal light and clarity where sin is unimaginable. But step two, Yeshua empties himself and comes to earth, the place of separation, where he experiences some degree of separation from God. In the fog of this world, Yeshua will be tempted. And we believe that this was a real temptation. He had a real choice here in this lowest realm. And his choice was to suffer even further separation, death on a cross. And while in the grave, he descends to a place of even more extreme separation. This all leads to step three, reunification. First, he is reunited with his own body at the, his resurrection. 
then with his disciples, and finally he is raised to sit at the right hand of God. And he will further return to bring a reunification to the whole earth between all men and God and between man and his fellow man. Well, finally, let's turn now to Joshua 10. In this chapter, we read about the southern campaign, how Israel rapidly takes all of southern Israel. In the last chapter, like chapter 9, Gibeon has deceived Israel into making a covenant with them that they should live, right? They made a covenant that Gibeon should live. In this chapter, Gibeon's neighbors decide that they can't allow that example to go unpunished. So they get together to attack Gibeon. The Gibeonites send a message to Israel pleading for help based on the covenant that they've just made with Israel. And Joshua comes running to help them. Israel marches all night from Gilgal and defeats the five southern kings. And so this is that famous battle where God rains down hail on Israel's enemies and where Joshua, in the sight of all Israel, calls out, Sun, stand still at Gibeon and moon in the valley of Ayalon. And it happens. The defeat of these five southern kings opens the doorway to defeating all of the southern kings, which Israel does quickly at this point. We are reading now in the Torah about the covenant God makes with Israel and with humanity through Israel, right? We are reading in Parsha Mishpatim, this giving of the covenant. In this chapter, in Joshua, Israel has likewise made a covenant with a Gentile nation, the Gibeonite Hivites, and they take their covenant with Gibeon seriously, deadly seriously. The result of Israel's steadfast faithfulness to this covenant with a Gentile people is miracle and victory and life. God's name is elevated in this chapter, and Joshua is also elevated in this chapter. And the crux of the action rests upon Israel being true to the covenant they made with the people who tricked them, but who are now nevertheless yoked to them. They have a covenant. What we read about in this single chapter is the entire southern campaign of the conquering of the land. A vast southern territory is here vanquished and quickly. The second to last verse of this chapter emphasizes how swiftly southern Israel was captured. And Joshua captured all these kings and their land at one time because the Lord God of Israel fought for Israel. Israel acted faithfully when the world would have made some excuse. Sorry, we're too far away from you to help. We can't get there in time. Israel makes no excuses. They march all night, then fight all day, and, and longer than a day, right? The day is extended. And God is with them. And what God does here is deal the critical blow against the southern Canaanite kings with the defeat of these five kings. Without these kings, the remaining southern kings don't have so many left to combine with you know, combine their for forces with to come against Israel. And Israel is able to pick them off one at a time in succession. We see much good coming from Israel's faithfulness to this covenant. We won't see such a miraculous victory again in the book of Joshua. God stops the sun here and the moon when Israel is protecting the Gibeonites. God so wants us to behave honorably and generously with each other as Israel does here with the Gibeonites. The covenant of Torah not only teaches us how to relate to God, but of course it teaches us how to relate to each other. In fact, much of the Torah is explicitly about how we deal with each other honorably and faithfully. Israel ignored their physical limitations to march all night and then fight all day, and they did so when the world would have said, don't don't bother with those crafty people. When we take that leap of faith to stretch the laws of nature, and when, in order to do what's right, we ignore the logic of the world, God does the same, right? When we take that leap of faith and say, I know this is impossible, but I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> you know, God honors that. God will suspend the laws of nature for us if we just take that first step into miracle on our own, you know, on our own 
If we on our own take that step into miracle, right? A lot of times he asks us to do that first. We take that first step into the water and then boom, the waters part. And he does that for the sake of righteousness and love. He suspends those physical laws and brings us to a place of transcending them. Well, we'll leave it there today. Thank you all for listening. I have posted an outline, as I said, below the video. May Adonai make us into a cherished bride who produces the fruit of the living word in this world. May he unlock for us the keys to understanding this beautiful world he has given us. And may we more and more see Yeshua in it. And may he make us into the people he wants us to be. Shalom.